Okay, it is now 6 o'clock. I call this regularly scheduled meeting of the San Benito County Planning Commission to order. If you could please read the temporary procedures. The San Benito County Planning Commission welcomes your comments. Each individual speaker will be limited to a presentation total of three minutes. When addressing the commission via Zoom, phone, or in the chambers, please state your name and country, uh, county in which you reside for the record. Please address the commission as a whole through the chair. If participating on Zoom, select the participants tab and click the raise hand icon. If you're using a phone, please press star nine to raise your hand. When your turn arrives, you will hear that you have been unmuted. If participating in person in the chambers, please complete a speaker card identifying the item on which you wish to speak and provide your completed card to the clerk prior to consideration of the item. Speaker cards are available on the table at the entrance. Thank you. Thank you. Pledge of Allegiance, uh, Commissioner Sliotti, if you could lead us in the pledge. Thank you. If we could get a roll call of the commissioners, please. Okay. District number two, Richard Way. Present. District number three, Robert Scagliotti, vice chair. Present. District number four, Robert Gibson, chair. Present. And our new planning commissioner, Commissioner Rodney Bianchi. R Rodney Bianchi. Present. District 1. Thank you. Certificate of posting. Can I get an acknowledgement and certificate of posting? I'll give you an acknowledgement. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Carries 4 0. Department announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, as mentioned uh, just right now by our clerk, uh, Dana, we want to welcome our supervis uh, um, our new planning commissioner, Rodney Bianchi, appointed by the uh, Board of Supervisors early this month, and he would be representing District 1, uh, Dom Zanger, so uh, Supervi um, Commissioner Bianchi, welcome aboard. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your service. <laughs> really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, the second announcement I would like to make, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the commission, is that the um, staff is working with uh, the commission and the Board of Supervisors for a potential special planning commission, joint planning commission, Board of Supervisors meeting for the month of March. It's going to be on a Tuesday. Potentially, we're looking at March 21st. The details would probably come within the next week or two regarding timing and so forth and agenda and, and so forth. So just wanted to see if that would work for you and to please keep it in, in, the, in your agendas. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And that'll do it for okay. the reports. Did uh, you want to introduce yourself to the public? Or? Yeah. Okay. Up to you. Uh, public comment. Is there any general public comment for anything that is not on the agenda but under the purview of the Planning Commission? Any public comment via Zoom? There is no public comment via Zoom. Any general public comment in the chambers? There is no public comment in the chambers. Okay, public comment is closed. <clears throat> Consent agenda. We have the resolution to authorize teleconferencing, acknowledgement of public hearing, and the adoption of the minutes from January 18th, 2023. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Nope. No? Okay. Is there any public comment for those three items? There's no public comment via Zoom or in the chambers. Public comment is closed. Is there a motion on the table? I'll move that we adopt the consent agenda. I'll second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 4-0. Regular agenda.
Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, on the regular agenda, we have item number one as the housing element progress report, and item number three is a general plan uh, progress report. And because the housing element is one of the elements within the general plan for uh, eff um, efficiency, we would recommend that if we can please have item number one as a general plan progress report, and then item number two as a housing element update. Okay. Thank you. We have uh, our principal planner, Ariel Goodspeed, in a teleconference, who will be providing us with the with the uh, report on the housing element update. Ariel, on the Hi, uh, good general plan. Good evening, everyone. Uh, can you see the PowerPoint presentation up on the screen? Yes. Yes. All right. I'll get started here. So uh, general plan, annual progress report, Ariel Goodspeed, principal planner. Um, let's see. There we go. So the general plan is essentially the constitution for land use. Uh, it affects um, all decisions for uh, government and land use and must be consistent with the general plan. This includes capital improvements, acquisition and sale of land, zoning, use permits, subdivision maps, specific plans and development agreements. It's comprehensive and long-term, 20 to 30 years. Ours goes till uh, 2035. Um, it includes statement of policies, diagrams, objectives, principles, standards, and proposals, and implementation measures. And then uh, today uh, is your uh, annual progress report that is required to be submitted by April 1st each year. Um, the mandatory elements in included within the general plan uh, need to be land use, circulation, housing, conservation, open space, noise, safety, um, and the housing element, which uh, will be presented later this evening. Um, so the adoption or amendment of a general plan or any element requires uh, tribal consultation, uh, planning commission, workshops and uh, public hearings, resolution with recommendations to the board. Um, the board uh, then hears a public a hearing notice given following receipt of planning commission report. Uh, if changes are not considered by planning commission, it has to go back for recommendation and then adoption by resolution. Uh, it could be combined with other land use approvals to provide consistency. Uh, for example, a subdivision map that also requires uh, a zone change. Uh, it's a subject to initiative or referendum by the petition of registered voters. Um, so this is uh, what is included in our general plan. We actually included three additional uh, sections in economic development, uh, public facilities and services element, and a health uh, and an administrative element that is uh, not uh, required um, per the state. And uh, each year, um, this annual report. Um, is submitted to both the Office of Planning and Research and the California Department of Housing and Community Development. There's uh, 11 different sections that are required to be within the general plan annual progress report. Um, most of uh, what we had uh, this year was uh, implementation of our different goals or policies um, and uh, some major development applications, which um, our director of uh, planning and building Abraham will uh, discuss further in today's agenda. And then after myself, we'll have Stephanie, um, our assistant planner, go through our uh, housing element annual progress report. So some of the highlights is uh, we finally had an adopted uh, zoning code which helped implement um, several of the general plan policies um, that is in the attached report you received tonight. Um, continuing on uh, with our joint habitat conservation plan and natural community conservation plan. Um, and uh, Riverview Regional Park is still ongoing. And we also established our commercial industrial sites database and uh, processing of major planning applications. I did uh, real quick actually want to, um, uh, so tonight staff will, you know, recommend, you know, that the board to receive and adopt the general plan annual progress report and submit to the state housing and uh, community development state office of planning research. 
Um, but before I go to any questions, I just wanted to actually uh, show uh, the example of one of those uh, databases. So let me just stop share screen and then reshare. Um, so this, uh, if you go to our uh, San Benito County uh, website and then you go to uh, the our geographic information uh, uh, systems uh, 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 department web page. Um, on there is um, uh, maps that you can view. And so there are two. One is the zoning and general plan uh, industrial, and the other is zoning and general plan industrial. And so essentially, um, what, what it does is uh, our industrial heavy and our industrial light um, general plan designations, and then our zoning of light industrial, heavy industrial, heavy industrial mineral resource or mineral resource is all mapped on the county. So let me just like click on one here. How about this one? So, so if you click on it, um, you can click here to go to the zoning ordinance. You can click here for a street view, uh, here to view the general plan on it. Um, and then uh, here you can click for general plan information and street view if you just want to, uh, it, it goes back and forth between the zoning and general plan. So um, here's an example, clicking on. So you can get a view. So um, our realtors or other people that are interested in um, a property uh, can, you know, get all of the zoning information uh, on it and then, you know, they can uh, get uh, a visual. And that concludes my presentation for tonight. Is, Is there, there any questions? questions? First, we'll go to a public comment to see if the public has any comments regarding that presentation. Is there any public comment in the chambers? There is no public comment in the chambers. Any public comment on Zoom? There is no public comment on Zoom. Okay, public comment is closed. Back to the commission. Are there any comments, questions, concerns, suggestions? Commissioner Way. Yeah, I don't think it really matters. Uh, there's a small typo on uh, page... Uh, I guess it's listed here as 112. Uh, the staff recommendation is that the board receive and adopt the general plan annual progress report. Tonight, what's being requested is that the commission receive and adopt and present it, you know, recommend that it be presented to the board. Is that more or less correct? Yes. Okay. But since this is just in the PowerPoint, it's not, not in the resolution. I don't think it matters. No. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Scaliotti, Commissioner Bianchi. Not as a moment. Go ahead. Let me look. Oh, okay. I have a whole list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, land use. LU-A, Urban Agricultural Buffer Requirement. Is that something that we're going to look into? Uh, it's been on there for 2015 and hasn't been... Implemented is that something we're going to implement or we're we just going to remove it from the general plan? And what does it take to get started on that process? Um, so uh, If we could add it to um, To uh, I, I can let the because it needs to be a I think a recommendation from the board uh to work on um i can include um that as one of the items uh to the board if they want to direct staff uh to begin working on that this year okay if you could do that please yep, uh, not a right, problem right to farm and ranch is our ordinance sufficiently strong enough to handle all the growth that we're experiencing especially from people that haven't experienced uh, rural life they're moving from the city and they haven't seen a tractor on the road or cattle is there anything that we can do to take a look at that ordinance to see if we need to strengthen it to protect yeah I, I don't believe it's been updated in many years i believe it came out of uh the ag commission's office i can um i can also present that to the board as uh, uh get direction uh, to work on that this year 
And I understand the EDC is working on SEDS on page 89. Uh, EDC is working on SEDS and that should be wrapped up shortly. Is there a presentation going to be made to the board or the planning commission once the SEDS is completed? Uh, we do have um, uh, regular uh, meetings uh, with uh, EDC. So I, I believe that was their plan, but I can double check on that. Appreciated. Um, and then on page 96, there's the Sheriff's Department standards and the Fire Department standards, and it talks about doing a study to see if there's an appropriate response time. Has, uh, is there any plan in place to check those stats for both departments? And what would it take uh, to do that? Uh, so, um, actually, uh, that was uh, uh, Eric Taylor uh, did email about that um, and uh, asking if they should do it in house or hire a consultant. Um, so I think he I think he was looking into um, uh, working on that. Um, I did not hear specifically back from the fire department. Um, so um, I can check check in with them and and try to see uh, what what they're uh, if they're planning on working on that this year. I have a question. Oh, Commissioner Scaliotti. On the administration element, the development and review of permit streamlining, has anybody checked into that? I see it's taking quite a long time for people here to get the permits processed. What are you doing to streamline the permit processing? So um, that was actually done through um, a part or part of it was addressed through our zoning code update um, by uh, turning certain applications to be either uh, permitted. Um, and so they would just need building permits or to be administrative uh, permit instead of going for a full use permit. So um, that was uh, addressed during that uh, during that update. Um, as well as we're working on updating um, our planning uh, application and uh, and then continual um, uh, in house uh, um, uh, study uh, study sessions and and uh, uh, planning team meetings. Could we see if we could invite the EDC to speak to the Planning Commission and see what uh, they have to say about that? Because I'm, I'm still hearing that there's grumblings that we're not as efficient as we could be. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Is it working? I mean, these plans that you did, are they working? Are we still doing the same old thing? Um, certain applications are processing quicker. Um, than than previous uh for uh, example um we used to have a special plan review uh that was essentially an administrative permit for um any structure over a thousand feet and because those have now uh been increased um there is a lot less planning applications being processed for those and it is going through um, building permits. So uh, that can't be the case necessarily for every application. Um, we do have uh, many uh, large uh, major planning uh, applications and Abraham can speak uh, to that and the efficiency of uh, processing these major uh, applications that has been done by staff um and uh, it's there are uh, certain uh you know requirements um you know CEQA requirements um tribal consultation requirements that um have have to be done uh, and add some uh, time but it it's uh, you know state requirements so uh, it has definitely increased um our uh our time uh uh, working on uh, applications uh, has uh, improved. We've also added uh, staff last year. Um, we now have three assistant planners um, on top of uh, a senior, a principal, and a director of planning and building. Um, so being uh, fully staffed um, also uh, 
uh, helps uh, increase that efficiency as well. I add also, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, uh, definitely not just for the major projects, pretty much one of the first things that we look at when we receive an application is whether or not the project is exempt from CEQA. There's a, there's a category on the uh, on our California Environmental Quality Act um, checklist that basically um, indicates all of the different types of exemptions. And so that's one of the first things that we look at. We have 30 days from which when we receive an application for us as staff, as part of the Permit Streamlining Act, to be able to to respond to the applicant and indicate what um, what is missing, and it's it's in in writing. But before we even go there uh, to to submit a um, uh, either a letter of com um, completion or a letter of incompletion, we we always require a pre-application meeting with the applicant as well. And when we sit down with them and we show. Um, all of the requirements that are needed to make the application complete, and we give them, we have them all, we have it all in writing. Unfortunately, though, not all of the time. I would say probably the majority of the time, not everything is included on uh, an application. But we have 30 days to 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 um, basically respond, uh, and and you know that's one thing that we 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 are required to do, and then. Uh, then we wait for the applicant to be able to submit. Sometimes we requ what's required takes an engineer to draft or or somebody with the with the license, civil engineer, for example. And so then that may take a few weeks to even a few months for them to to submit to us. And then at that point, we then start the environmental process if if needed. If not needed, then we can definitely do a categorical exemption. And it's a little tough sometimes. Like one of the straightforward categorical exemptions from CICA would be if it's like if if it's substantially surrounded by other development. And because we're in the county, it's a little bit difficult to apply, you know, that as opposed to if it was in, in a city where there's development surrounded. But um, definitely that's something that we're, you know, working hard to, to be able to to um, uh, to achieve, get get things rolling faster. Okay. Thank you. And if question. Yeah. From the time the applicant applies for the 30 days, what's your average to give back to them? So, so when the the applicant ap applies to the um, planning department, and so within thirty days we we respond. Um, it can be within if it's a pretty straightforward application within the first two weeks. If it's a little bit more of a major application, it can take us you know potentially the thirty days. Uh, but it it really just depends. Yeah, and and if it is, if it's pretty if it's pretty complete, um, we we. We're able to tell, um, you know, right away because we we look at the submittal, we look at the plans, and we compare it to the application checklist, and we we see that, and if everything's good, you know, we send a pretty straightforward notice of completion. Okay, thank you. If you could reach out to EDC and see if there's any interest yeah. in them coming to us, whether it's at a public hearing or otherwise, you I would it. appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Done with that one. For now. Okay. Uh, going to page one. I'm almost done. Going to page 102. Program AD-B Digital Government. Uh, is there any more work to be done on getting things online so that we can save people from having to do public information requests, etc., or calling in to check on permits? Where are we in that process? Yes. Um, we are. There is still a fair amount of work to be done on digitizing. Um, all of our records, and that has been slow, uh, but ongoing. Thank um, you. I we'll keep checking in. And the other item on that page was the five-year general plan review. If you could please request that the board find funding ASAP to uh, take a look at the general plan. Um, yes, I, I will include that, and um, we actually have uh, one uh, that was uh, the the board uh, had us uh, begin working on a, a general plan amendment uh, to our study areas. And we, uh, staff is actually going to also be uh, uh, bringing um, another item to the February 28th meeting to uh, be looking at um, our, our general, uh, plan um, and the natural uh, 
uh, resources section under our land use. And so that'll be another um, section that will be natural and cultural resources uh, element that we'll, we'll be uh, looking into. Um, uh, but we, we can, uh, we can ask the board about, about the five year as well. That was my last comment uh, for that section. Uh, Commissioner Way. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, step back to page 100 under HS-I, Community Wildfire Protection Plan. I'm become increasingly concerned with the number of homeowners in San Benito County and, and our neighboring counties whose fire insurance is being canceled on the grounds that they are in fire hazard zones. And I don't know if adoption of a stronger community wildfire protection plan would have any impact on this, nor do I really have a great familiarity with what the existing plan is. So I'm hoping that we can get some information on the plan itself and whether we should ask the board to look at what they might be able to do in regards to preventing some of these cancellations. And I realize that in large part, this is a state issue and maybe there's not a whole lot that an individual county can do, but to the extent that there is anything that we can do, I would like to make sure that we're doing it um not a, not a problem uh so uh uh fire standards and uh fire code uh the california fire code is adopt uh is adopted um every three years and so the 2022 california fire code amendments are going to be adopted um in early 2023 i'm not sure if it's going to the february 28th meeting or if it's going to a march uh meeting um so it is it is regularly done. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not quite familiar with uh, specifics on the insurance or what's going on with that um, issue. But as far as uh, fire standards, those are updated on a regular basis, uh, like like our uh, built California building codes. Fire standards, rather than building codes per se. But yes, thank you. Commissioner Scaliotti. I have a statement. Maybe we should have the Board of Supervisors go back to California Department of uh, Cal Fire and see if we can get them back on board as our county um, fire protection instead of the city of Hollister. That would help with what you're talking about. We get Cal Fire oh. back. We had yeah. districts so. in the south. And we ought to have the Board of Supervisors go back and talk to Cal Fire about coming back on board with us. Well, the county in conjunction with cal fire they conduct an annual review of the san benito county community wildfire protection plan um so that plan is done on an annual basis and it is uh uh our contract with the Hollister fire it's done with cal fire um so uh but i i can uh we can bring this up to the board and um I, I'm not. I'm not quite sure what's going on specifically with the uh, the insurance or or why insurance is dropping. So I, I can't uh, respond specifically uh, to that. Um, but if if uh, one of the planning commissioners has more detailed information, they would like to email staff that you know can help provide us. Uh, we can reach out to uh, uh, Cal Fire and County Fire. Thank you. Any other comments, questions, or concerns? Not at the moment. Is there a motion on the table? Um, I'll move that we uh, process this along to the board. Okay. So we have a motion to recommend the Planning Commission uh, recommends to the board to approve the general plan annual progress report. Is there a second? I have a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion aye. carries 4-0. Thank, Thank you. you. Now we're going back to the housing element. Okay. Thank you. Kasun hai. Okay, if I could get my slides pulled up on the screen. And good evening, commissioners. Stephanie Reck, assistant planner. 
Um, <coughs> Commissioner Bianchi, for some context, I am in charge of um, operating the duties of a housing coordinator in the county, which is why I'm here presenting the housing element annual progress report. So let's get started. Um, Today we're gonna to talk about the housing element and the report, um, but first I wanna provide you with a small overview of what the housing element is in general. So the housing element is one of the components of the general plan, like Ariel stated, um, but it is updated more frequently than the general plan. So in comparison, the general, um, the general plan is updated every 20 years and the housing element is updated every eight years. So the housing element is used to identify adequately zoned sites to meet the share of regional housing needs at all income levels. It is used to develop strategies to provide for and meet those housing needs. The housing element includes the regional housing needs allocation, otherwise known as RENA, um, which is the state's projected housing needs to accommodate various income categories. The housing element also provides identification and analysis of existing and projected housing needs. It includes a statement of goals, policies, financial resources, and quantified objectives related to our housing needs. And it also includes the preservation, improvement, and development of housing. So there are five goals of the housing element. The first, um, goal one, is to focus on the availability of housing. Goal two is to focus on the development of housing. Goal three is to focus on the maintenance of housing. Goal four is for equal housing opportunity, and goal five is to focus on energy conservation. So we are currently nearing the end of our fifth cycle of the housing element, which spanned from 2015 to 2023. Subsequently, we are gearing up for our sixth housing element cycle, which will run from 2023 to 2031. So what is the housing element progress report? Annually, our jurisdiction is required to submit a housing element report which details the status and progress we have made in implementing these, <laughs> the housing element. So the report details project applications, issued building permits, and certificates of occupancy for all income levels, any annexations or changes of public land during the calendar year. Once the report is complete, it is submitted to the Governor's Office of Planning and Research and to the California Department of um, Housing and Community Development. The report will be presented um, to the Board of Supervisors should you choose to recommend it to them on March 14th, 2023. So um, in regard to the sixth um, cycle housing element timeline, um, the county has approved applications for LEAP and REAP um, and I, I have to apologize, I believe it was the LEAP grant was reallocated um, to support the ADU plans, so it was not used for the housing element. Um, and so the county signed um, a memorandum of understanding between AMBAG and COG in January of 2021 to have a little more than $79,000 allocated to unincorporated county for REAP funding. So in September of 2021, COG received our arena determination of 5,005 units and um, for our three jurisdictions. So in October of 2022, COG adopted their methodology for the arena allocation per jurisdiction and income level. So this methodology was then approved by the State Department of HCD in November of 2022 and was then dis 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 dispersed, I'm sorry, to the three jurisdictions. Um, so in December, the county posted a request for qualifications and RFQ to work with a consultant to amend our update our housing element. Um, unfortunately, we, we received no applications and we subsequently reposted our RFQ and have reached out to some other contractors. Um, so the housing element is due to the state by the end of 2023, so December of this year, um, which is coming up soon. So um, here's our RENA allocation methodology option F that was adopted by COG and approved by HCD. Um, you'll notice a total of 5,005 units. You'll see it in the RENA column on the right. 5,005 units were allocated for our three jurisdictions. Unincorporated County was allocated 754 of those units to be broken down as 246 for very low income, 198 for low income, 103 for moderate income, and 207 for above moderate income. 
So additionally, the county is required to report on extremely low income units, which is a default number that is typically one half of the very low income units. So in other words, we are required to report on an additional 123 extremely low units, which is not captured in this breakdown. So again, um, as part of our housing element, the county has updated our inclusionary housing ordinance, um, which requires new construction to provide affordable units to below moderate income levels. Um, historically, the inclusionary housing program was enacted in 2004 and went through the amendment process in 2016, 2020, and most recently again in January of 2023. Additionally, the in-lieu fee was adopted by the board into the master fee schedule during a regularly scheduled public hearing on January 27, January 17, 2023. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> so uh, the fee is a $30 per square foot um, fee to be applicable to fractional units and developments of five to 10 units. So in 2022, we were successfully able to complete our housing feasibility study in lieu fee analysis and ordinance amendments, which were subsequently adopted in 2023. So as of February 2023, all development applications submitted to the county must comply with the recently amended inclusionary housing ordinance. So without further ado, this is a snapshot of what we have done since 2015. So for 2022, we built two units in the very low category and 10 units in the low income category. These units are the second phase of Riverview 2. Phase one of Riverview two is another 12 units captured in 2021 with four being very low and eight being in the low income category. So no moderate units were permitted or granted their certificate of occupancy in 2022. However, 160 above moderate units were constructed. So the green cells on the right show how many units we have remaining per arena allocation. Um, so you will notice that we have not progressed very far for our below moderate income levels. In the above moderate income category, you will notice the opposite. We have built 1,070 units when we were only required to build 355. Um, so our total RENA allocation is 837, split among um, the different income categories. So uh, staff requests that the Planning Commission accept the report and recommend it to be presented to the Board of Supervisors for um, to be submitted to the Office of Planning and Research and the State Department of Housing and Community Development. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments, questions, or concerns from the commissioners? No. Commissioner Way. Yeah, I just want to point out that accepting the report is very different from liking the report. <laughs> <laughs> so, for what that's worth, I, I'm I'm flabbergasted by some of these numbers, as, as I mentioned on Monday. So, yeah. Okay. Is there any public comment? Public comment? There is no <laughs> public comment. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. You know I'm not going to stay quiet the whole evening. Okay. So as Commissioner Way has said, it's, it's, it's very disappointing to see the numbers. Um, there's nothing that we, there's nothing you can do about the past, but what is it that we're going to do for the future to get those numbers up? The floods that happen on Lover's Lane is a great example of how we lack low and very low housing in San Benito County. And this in lieu fees is a dangle by the developers always. Uh, they're going to they're gonna provide affordable housing, but first they're going to build their market and above market before and the low and the, the multi-units are the last thing to get done. Um, what can be done on, it's, this is not a, an issue on staff, and this is not an issue, I get our, our, the responsibility falls upon our community and upon the planning commissioners when you have developers come forward by, for you, no, I'm not going that way, come forward with you to allow so that we can have these housing uh, numbers increase this is really embarrassing, and this is not the fault of the current commission. This is not a fault of the staff, but this is the this is how it's always happened, and we have had people say, "Oh, well, this is the way we've always done it." That has to stop, and I know that the current commissioners have tried to do that. Um, 
but you also have this thing that um, I don't know what it's called. So some, help me here, somebody, that you're going to build your development, and you're good, and you have the ability to. Uh, yeah, my time. I know. I noticed. I took. <laughs> I'm keeping track, don't worry. Um, the housing, uh, the market rate, but you don't want to have low income in that development, so you have a radius of 10 miles. Well, that's, that's literally, think about it, that it's Hollister. It's only San, seven miles to San Juan Batista, so that means now you're, that they can send those low income housing or the, to um, Aromas, the distance. Well, no one is gonna build housing in South County, and no one is gonna build housing in, in uh, North County. So when you approve these projects, somehow there has to be a way that you cannot allow them to say, okay, well, we're gonna do our development, but we're gonna do the low housing over here in, you know, in the area of San Juan Batista, the area of Tres Pinos, uh, however it is from the project. So there's gotta be a way for all of us to be able to have and have this housing and have it for the low and low income. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment in the chambers for this item? Is there any public comment via Zoom? Yes, um, there is Barry Katz. You have been unmuted. Hi, uh, my name is Phyllis Katz, and I would like to, um, I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Way that this is an embarrassment to the county and that it's critical that the county start building affordable housing or all of the, all of its um, planning units, all of the, the building that they to want to be building could be halted. Um, and uh, there's a very logical way of proceeding on this matter. And that is that whenever the planning commission authorizes the construction of new housing, they require that, for example, every 10 units allowed at least Want, then they need. Then the developer needs to build the affordable housing. Um, it's a mistake to allow a developer to put in all of their market rate housing, and then expect them to go back and do their affordable housing. The construction of the affordable housing has to be intimately integrated within the development plans, and the market rate housing has to be approved in increments so as to ensure the development of the low and very low income housing. Thank you. Abraham, could you comment on our current process? Yes, absolutely, uh, Chair Gibson, thank you for that. So uh, we can definitely, and I think that that's very critical in regards to making sure that either uh, affordable housing gets built at the same time or concurrently as market rate or if it's in a multifamily as aspect. Um, and so uh, one of the ways that we can do that is through like a condition of approval that indicate that um, for every, after the 25% of, of market rate homes, uh, then the affordable housing has to be built as well. So those, there's ways that we can include uh, that requirement to be able to have a concurrent development uh, when building permit stage. Okay. Thank you. Um, if I can add, uh, it is in the inclusionary ordinance that um, permits for market rate units are issued. Um, so the permits for affordable units are issued prior to or concurrently with market rate units. So it is in our inclusionary ordinance that those affordable units, we want those built first. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? There are no more hands raised on Zoom. Public comment is closed. Back to the commission. Uh, I just had a question about page 47, $2.4 million to build 11 transitional housing units at the Migrant Center. Could you explain uh, what happened with that and, and where those units are, or the, if they're in use? Uh, 
So I'm going to have to um, either defer or get you that information as a follow-up. Most of the programs and the housing element report are run through Health and Human Services. So Enrique Ariola would have those answers. I do not. Abraham? Yeah, we actually have Steve Loop who's um, here who can, who can address that. Thank you. Yeah, so the, um, the 2.4 million project up on Southside Road, I think is the question, correct? Chair? Uh, yes. Yeah, so in addition to uh, the five units, which are smaller units to be used in a kind of an affordable housing capacity or for folks that um, can't afford a market rate type of situation, um, in addition to the, the five units, we are performing all the site work around those units. And actually, um, we're performing the uh, laterals and the mainline utilities so that an additional 11 units can be installed in the future. So to give an example, we're um, going to be installing 11 more units for just another $2 million grant that was just um, granted so that most of that 2 million will go to the actual units. Whereas for the first five, you know, a lot of the, the funding actually went to the site work to accommodate the future 11. So. Okay. That makes sense. Cause it looked a little sad out there the other day when I visited yeah, we're trying to button it up in the next three months so that we can start the next phase. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, that was it for myself. Uh, are there any other comments, questions, or concerns from the commission? Or is there a motion on the table? I motion that we adopt it and send it to the board. Okay, we have a motion to recommend the, the board approve this. Is there a second? Second. Well, there's a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 4-0. Thank you. Item number two. We can have the... Um If we can have CMAP, please um, include it in our PowerPoint. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the Planning Commission. This item is here, uh, it's an informational item basically to uh, include information about the Planning Commission's discretionary approvals and or denials of projects that came in within the last 24 months. And then also uh, we'll talk a little bit about pending discretionary approvals that will be coming before you in the next few months. Um, including ne next month, and then also we'll discuss some cannabis applications and hemp applications. With that, we'll start with um, the first project, and that's uh, the conditional use permit for Kawara Agricultural Facility, and that's located on Zero Answer San Juan uh, ro Road, southwest of Highway 101 and Highway 129. And that is for a, a nursery with no on-site retail. It was uh, it came before the Planning Commission on June 16, 2021, and it was for an assortment of uh, perennials, herbs, vegetables, ground cover, on ornamental grasses, hanging baskets, and container baskets. Um, and it's uh, uh, approved a total of 518,000 square feet of greenhouse buildings on approximately 104 uh, acres. And at this time, the status is that the application's on hold by the applicant. <laughs> and if you have any questions on any of these, um, uh, anything that you would like for us to do on following up, uh, feel free to let us know. But um, I was hoping kind of going through these and then and then stop for questions. Well, just, just one quick thing on this one. You, yes. you said it's southwest. The diagram shows that it's southeast, I believe. Of the intersection, sorry, of the intersection of... Um, Yes, southeast, you're right. Okay, thank you're right. you. Yeah, 101. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Wee. Mr. Chair? And Please thank proceed. You. Thank you. So uh, the Mendes Temporary Use Permit uh, came before the Planning Commission on July 21st, and uh, it's located at 7980 Lovers Lane of July 21st of 2021, and approximately zero, half a mile south of Highway 152. 
and it was a proposal for live music events with food and beverages uh, for up to 400 persons on a 12.25 acre site and uh, the information that we have um, was that the Planning Commission denied the uh, major temporary use permit. And like I said, if you'd like us to get more detail and get more information, we can provide that for you. But um, it, it more than likely when we get temporary use permits, we um, work with the Sheriff's Department, Fire Department, and usually bring, they have all of their concerns um, in the table and we, we provide them to you prior to uh, making a determination. We have the wireless use permit renewal um, that came before you July 21st, 2021, located at 2680 Buena Vista Road, approximately one fifth of a mile uh, east of Highway 156. And this was a renewal of the approval of a 66 foot false tree monopole with 12 antennas and associated equipment. And the status of this is that it has been approved and complete. We have Feliz Feria use permit that came before the Planning Commission on August 18, 2021 at um, 805 Orchard Road, located just east of Highway 156. And the applicant proposed a drywall business in the existing structure uh, with additional parking and a 560 square foot building to store materials used in support for the drywall business on approximately 26.42 acres. And um, the applicant unfortunately uh, even though it was approved, did not proceed, and at this time it has been expired. Minor subdivision, the Garcia parcel, came before the Planning Commission on August 18, 2021, located at 470 Orchard Road between uh, 156 and Orchard Road, and it proposes a subdivision of a 17.66 acre site into uh, one lot that would have 7.66 acres and consist of the existing home and barn and uh, lots two and three would have five acres each and the current status is that it's under com uh, conditions compliance and Steve can correct me if I'm wrong but I think we just finalized that uh, parcel and, and has been signed off so that's the status on that. The Tobias uh, use permit came before the Planning Commission on September 15, 2021, located at 2250 Shore Road, approximately one and a half mile east of Highway 25, and it proposed a 25,000 square foot metal warehouse building to be used for produce storage and for maintenance of farm equipment. And uh, the current status on that is that uh, building permits have been obtained, but the building has not yet been finalized. We have the Walnut Harvest Warehouse Use Permit that came before the Planning Commission November 17th, 2021, located at 1550 Fallon Road, about uh, three-fifths of a mile west of Fairview Road. And that's to construct and operate a 33,120 square foot warehouse for walnut harvest storage. And uh, the applicant has not moved forward to obtain building permits. It's the current status of this project. The next is uh, minor subdivision PLN 210016 at 700 Duncan Avenue, located between Lucy Brown Lane to the west and Bixby Road to the east, approximately one mile north of Highway 156. And the proposed subdivision of a 23.7 acre parcel uh, was brought before the Planning Commission for a subdivision into two parcels of a 10.1 acre and 13.6 acre. And currently this uh, site is under condition compliance. We have one of two uh, cannabis uh, use permits uh, that came before you at the December 15, uh, 2021 Planning Commission meeting. And this is for 1180 Riverside Road. It's at the V.S. Stoney Farms Cannabis Cultivation Use Permit located approximately a tenth of a mile south of the Brigantino Park and half a mile south of San Juan Hollister Road. And this is for a proposed 4,600 square foot building plus a 1,500 square foot office building to operate a cannabis cultivation facility. And the proposal also includes a 4,000 square foot residence. And this project is currently under condition compliance, so making sure that all, all of the conditions within the resolution that that your uh, commission approved are uh, meeting the, the requirements. We have a temporary use permit, uh, Valise Torres Perdue. It's uh, 1740 Santa Ana Road. It's uh, located on Prater Way, approximately a quarter of a mile north of Santa Ana Road and approximately a quarter of a mile west of Fairview Road. Came before the Planning Commission February 16, 2022. 
and uh, the proposal was for three temporary mobile homes on an existing 7.12 acre property with an existing single family home and an existing agricultural uh, use consisting of seasonally rotating crops. The planning commission did not approve the request. The applicant appealed to the Seminole County Board of Supervisors and the board granted the approval of two temporary mobile homes instead of the three proposals. The uh, Monopo use permit, March 16th, 2022, uh, Planning Commission meeting and at 10 Flint Road, the um, proposal was for a 95-foot monopole that would stand 122 feet west of Flint Road and 499 feet north of Highway 156. And the uh, monopole would have four levels of mounting of equipment. And uh, at this point, the status is that it needs to obtain a building permit from the RMA department. Minor subdivision PLN 220008 at 530 and 540 uh, Acquista Pace Road. It's um, located approximately two fifths of a mile to the west of Ferry Road and approximately half a mile south of Highway 156. The proposed subdivision is of a 26.37 acre site in, um, uh, proposed to be subdivided into one 5.12 acre uh, parcel and the other 21.25 acres and each proposed lot is currently built with an existing residence with no further construction currently proposed and the uh, application is currently under condition compliance we're making sure that all the conditions of approval are being met the second of the two cannabis applications that have been processed and brought before you is uh, san juan green cannabis cup a condition use permit at 2400 san juan hollister road east of san Benito river bridge came before the Planning Commission on September 21st, 2022. And this is a proposed commercial cannabis cultivation, manufacturing and distribution facility, beginning with the cannabis cultivation in an existing 10,608 square foot building. And the subsequent uh, um, proposals from the applicant, which also got approved at, on September, were to build two additional buildings, one at 5,760 square feet, another at 8,400 square feet, each two stories in height. And the status on this project is that it's currently under condition compliance. The Betterville Commercial Conditional Use Permit, it's, um, it is located at 9644 Betterville Road, about um, just north of 101 and one at 156 intersection came before the Planning Commission in October of 2022. And the project would develop and improve approximately 26 acres of a 111.61 uh, acre property area. And uh, the development would be approximately 108,425 square feet of total commercial uh, building space. And it would be all along uh, Betobo Road and it would consist of a gas station with a convenience store, a restaurant, an informational center, a motel, and banquet hall with outdoor pool and an outdoor movie screen that would be away from Highway 101 and an outdoor event center. And the design of the project would be reminiscent of the 1940s and 1950s American roadside. And the Planning Commission at the October uh, meeting uh, approved the Betterville com uh, Commercial Conditional Use Permit uh, then it was subsequently appealed by um, the um, uh, Shoot Mahali uh, law firm, who represents the Amal Muslim Tribal Band and um, M. Wolf law firm. And it came before the Board of Supervisors in November, and the Board of Supervisors upheld the Planning Commission's decision of approving the Petable Com Conditional Use Permit. Um, and uh, the current status is that it is currently in litigation. And we have the Lance of Lee tentative map located at 291 Old Ranch. Came before the Planning Commission in November of 2022. The project consists of the subdivision with subsequent development of a 27.45 acre lot into 141 residential lots, a public park, an open space, internal public streets, and improvements to Old Ranch Road. The project includes 121 single family detached homes and 20 attached duet units. Planning Commission denied. The um, uh, subdivision request, it came before the, the Board of Supervisors in February of 2023, and the board upheld the Planning Commission's denial of the uh, project. 
So that is it in regards to the 24 months of discretionary uh, applications that came before the Planning Commission. Now I'm going to discuss the pending discretionary applications that will be coming before you as soon as next month. Um, but before I go to that, if it's the desire of, of um, Mr. Chair and, and the Commission, if you have any questions on the first part, or if you would like me to just continue and wait till the end. Anyone have any questions about the first part of the presentation? No. no. Continue on, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> First one is minor subdivision, um, PLN 220014, known as rent subdivision, located at 3508 John Smith Road. It's a proposal to subdivide a 49.08 acre site into three parcels. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, lot one would be 5.01 acres, lot two would be 5.42 acres, and lot three would be 38.65 acres. And um, parcel one on the future subdivision, if approved by the Planning Commission, the one existing residence would remain on parcel one, on the future parcel one pending approval. The application was submitted on April 11, 2022. A notice of incomplete was provided within 30 days, and then the application was then deemed complete on July 18, 2022. Then um, subsequently, the uh, uh, environmental work pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act was done, including, including AB 52 consultation, and so the Mitigated negative declaration is complete now and it's under public review and it is anticipated to be uh, um, done within the next uh, couple of weeks and uh, we'll respond to all comments and bring it before you uh, for the next planning commission meeting of March is the current status of this project. The next one is known as the uh, minor subdivision PLN 220012 uh, Lucas Ford located at 6810 Fairview Road, approximately 1.3 miles south of Highway 156. And the proposal is to subdivide a 10.69 acre site into two parcels. One lot would be five acres, another lot would be 5.69 acres, and one existing residence would be remain on the future parcel two, if approved by the Planning Commission. Application was submitted March 17, 2022. Notice of incomplete was provided within 30 days and the application was deemed complete May 26, 2022, almost, almost June. And the um, uh, environmental document was then subsequently prepared. Uh, consultation per AB 52 was done and its um, uh, uh, mitigated negative declaration has been complete and it is anticipated to come before you for a public hearing and determination by the Planning Commission at the next Planning Commission of March. Next one, minor subdivision, PLN 220004, Russell, located at 1175 Comstock Road, approximately 0 .0 0 0.75 miles east of Fairview, approximately, uh, approximately two miles south of Highway 156. It's a request to subdivide a 38.93 acre site into four lots consisting of one lot being 23.570 acres <clears throat> and the other three lots at five acres each. Uh, lot one would keep the existing primary residence, two existing additional residences, and three existing accessory structures, all on the future lot one, and then the others um, would be vacant. And uh, a CEQA mitigated negative declaration is on its way for this particular site, including um, AP52 consultation as well. We have the minor subdivision PLN 220024, known as the Brigantino subdivision, located at 4701 Santa Ana Valley Road. And the proposal is to subdivide a 562.8 acre site into three parcels. One uh, parcel would consist of 165.8 acres, lot two would consist of 136.9 acres, and lot three would consist of 260.1 acres. Uh, one existing residence is on site and it would remain in proposed parcel number one and one existing residence um, that's also on site would remain and uh, would be located on proposed parcel number two and this mitigated negative declaration um, CEQA is uh, on its way for this project as well. The next shows a, an overview of all the other major projects that we have underway. Uh, the olive green color at the very top are um, projects that are numbered within the map. And, and uh, if you can see in the map, those sites that are in olive green are built in auction approval and or board of supervisors approval. Uh, the other, the um, lime green color right below that, it's uh, projects that have been approved but not yet have begun construction. 
And then th those in purple are those that are un uh, underway. And those are the ones that I'm gonna focus on, on uh, at this time. And then the others that are in orange are actually those that have been approved also and are under construction. So the ones that I'm gonna discuss out of this list are as follows, uh, follows. Traveler Station, John Smith Landfill Expansion, Richmark Infill, uh, tentative subdivision map, and uh, Strata Verde Innovation Park, and the Ag Center, uh, one of our latest applications. First one, Traveler Station. It's a 2.6 acre site at the southwest corner of the intersection of US Highway 101 and 129. It's a proposed 4,000 square foot convenience store, auto fueling and truck fueling services, propane cells, electric vehicle charging station, and a county informational kiosk. Traveler Station will be uh, in operation 24 hours a day if approved by the Planning Commission. Travel consultation has been requested and it's ongoing. And the projected Planning Commission date for this project would be summer of 2023. PLN 21002, the John Smith Landfill Expansion. Uh, the proposal includes a, a um, expansion to a 388.05 acre expansion um, of the existing 95.16 acre site. If you can see on the map, the line uh, denoted in red is the existing landfill site, and then right above that, the line denoted in black is the proposed expansion. And the requirements uh, for this proposal include an EIR, Environmental Impact Report Certification, an adoption of the mitigation monitoring and reporting program that is would be done in conjunction conjunction with the EIR, and of course findings of approval if um, it is the desire of the commission to to approve and recommend to the board, or findings of denial if it is a um, recommendation of the uh, planning commission to deny and and recommend to the board. It would also request require a zone change and a use permit. The status of this project is that the uh, draft environmental impact report public re review comment period ended, and staff is in the process of responding to all of the letters that were received during the uh, public review period of the draft environmental impact report. There was close to 100 letters that were uh, provided, and so uh, we have to respond to all of them and make sure that they are uh, also reviewed uh, by county council to make sure that all legal requirements have been met in the response, and then a final environmental impact report then would be prepared, and at that time then we can start the public hearings before the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors, which are uh, at this time projected to be um, in the summer or fall of 2023, um, both with the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors. If anything changes, we'll make sure to come before you and, and let you know. I uh, know that we have a, a new uh, Planning Commission on, on board representing District 1, Ronnie, uh, Commissioner Ronnie Bianchi, and and so if it's if it's something that the Planning Commission, Mr. Chair, and and, and Planning Commission would desire, we can uh, continue with doing these um, uh, workshops uh, to come before you um, to provide that information to you. Definitely, yeah. thank you. Very well, you're welcome. We have the Richmark Infill tentative subdivision map, which proposes uh, 160 single family residential units and 15 duplex uh, buildings, basically one building on uh, two units on one building uh, for below market rate um, uh, for a total of 190 units within the Richmark uh, subdivision. And in addition to the units, there is a proposal for a 107 thousand square foot hotel a 150 uh, with 154 rooms and also 31,800 square foot commercial area within the same proposal and what the applicant would require in order for us to bring this this item before the planning commission subsequently to the board of supervisors is an environmental impact report which is on, on, in its way um, zone change to commercial neighborhood c2 and uh, plan unit development and also vesting tentative map uh, application uh, for the Planning Commission to consider. And the project, uh, the projected release date of the draft environmental impact report, it's spring of 2023. And the projected Planning Commission dates would be summer of 2023 for public hearings and also for the Board of Supervisors. Strata Verde Innovation Park is a proposed automotive research and development campus and business center on a 2,767-acre triangular site, uh, essentially between Highway 25 and Highway 101 in San Benito County. 
the um, actual development consists of approximately 166 acres of that 2,767 acre site. And the uh, request from the applicant would be to approve a general plan amendment, a specific plan, a zone change, a vesting tenant map, uh, and a development agreement, all within this one project. The environmental impact report is currently uh, being prepared and underway with the projected draft environmental impact report public review um, release in potentially summer of 2023 and then planning commission and board of supervisors public hearings to take place and tentatively the last quarter of 2023. And again, we would offer that same um, uh, request to bring in workshops and so forth prior to those dates if that's the desire of Mr. Chair and the, and the planning commission. Definitely, yeah, we're gonna have a busy summer. We, we definitely will be. <laughs> Seven Little Ag Center, this is a, a one of our most recent applications that have been submitted to the planning department. And uh, it's a proposal for a 16,450 square foot convenience store, 12,500 square foot truck uh, service building, and a 13,500 square foot cold storage. And this um, uh, would have park parking would be available with what's called an electric auxiliary power units, APU. And what's important about this is that it would allow for hookups, um, hookups allowing trucks waiting on a time slot to park and turn off engine and keep refrigerated units running. So essentially, the trucks would not have to idle if they go to this uh, place and, and hook up. And uh, one of the things that we were discussing on the pre-application meeting is that this would be uh, more than likely very favorable to the California Highway Patrol, um, and uh, which you know does not seem to like very much that trucks park on the side. A lot of the times, as you may know, uh, processing centers, agricultural processing centers, have certain times before they allow trucks to come in, and so they need a place to park. A lot of the times they'll park on the side of the road to wait. This would provide a, a place for trucks to be able to hook up and not idle, keep them in, just hook up to these APU units and keep the, um, the storage cold on their, um, in their trucks. And so um, this was uh, a notice of incomplete application has been sent to the applicant. Uh, it was pretty substantial. And so at this time, we are awaiting the applicant to provide what was requested by the planning department and what's basically on its, in its application. But this, this is on its way. Before I get into commercial cannabis and hemp applications, are there any questions in regards to the um, pending applications that we are currently processing? Commissioner Way. Commissioner Scaliotti. Oh, I'm good, thank you. Commissioner Bianchi. No, There's multiple ways to pronounce it, but it's Bianchi. Okay, on to the commercial cannabis and hemp, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Commercial cannabis and hemp applications, as I mentioned, there are two applications regarding cannabis that I had previously discussed, the Canna Green on San Juan Road and the Villa Stony Farms just um, south of the Brigantino Park, south, south of San Juan Hollister Road. And so that this is the VIA one that we have um, currently on the um, condition compliance, and then the uh, the Canna Green one on San Juan Hollister Road also in condition compliance. We have another four applications that we are currently kind of we've done a pre-application meeting on and we're discussing. So we're hoping that we can deem those um, hopefully complete and bring them bring them before you so we can start those conversations. On on that process has that been figured out so that the state doesn't send it back to us for a lot of detail that hasn't been in the previous ones the first time around? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, um, Chair Gibson. So yes, we, um, we're, we have an established process here where, where the first part would be to do a pre-application meeting. We meet and make sure that we have, um, the applicant has all the requirements that we, we have as, as, as an agency and that they also meet all of the requirements that the state has as well. And then, um, so, so we're, we're following that process and um, hoping that um, it gets smoother as, as, we, as we move along. Thank you. You're welcome. And the industrial hemp applications, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, the hemp applications is actually pro are actually processed by the Agricultural Commission. Um, but just as the cannabis applications, if there's any type of 
building or improvements that are required to be on site, any type of building uh, improvements, uh, anything that requires a discretionary permit, um, then that would come before your planning commission for review and approval. The ones I'm gonna mention um, here very briefly are uh, the uh, California Grown Hemp uh, application, Zero Bolsa Road. It's located along Highway 25, approximately a quarter of a mile south of Highway 101. It is on a site that consists of 201.47 acres. It's under uh, under uh, agricultural productive zone, and they received approval by the agricultural commissioner in August. I mean, sorry, in 2021 and 2022. Dubler and Sons at Overfell Ranch, located southwest of Union Road and, and Highway 156 uh, of, uh, um, west of San Juan Oaks Road. And these are three uh, separate parcels, three separate APNs consisting of a total of 378.72 acres in an agricultural protective zone. And they also received approval by the Agricultural Commissioner on uh, 2021 and 2022. 38419 Pinoch Road, um, it's a 133.52 acre site. It's uh, in the agricultural rangeland. It uh, received approval by the um, Agricultural Commissioner in 2021 and 2022. With respect to that particular project, um, it was uh, determined that they were actually growing um, cannabis and there was an enforcement action uh, brought to uh, abate that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, hmm. Joel, for that update. Pacheco Creek, uh, Creek Gardens, located at 7958 Lovers Lane, approximately one mile south of Highway 152. It's uh, on a site that consists of 70.36 acres in the agricultural productive zoning district of the county, and it got the approval in 2021 and in 2022. The same issue there in terms of an enforcement action and an abatement. Thank you, Joel, for the update. <clears throat> Pinnacle Seed Services. That's um, three separate parcels within the vicinity. Um, well, not so much the vicinity, but um, three separate parcels, South County, uh, for a total of 594.71 acres and in the agricultural rangeland, and it received approval in 2021 and 2022 by the Agricultural Commissioner. Ivan Garcia, 8050 Lovers Lane, a little over half a mile south of Highway 152. It's a, a, a site of 13.43 acres. It's in the Agricultural Productive Zoning District and it received approval last year in 2022 by the Agricultural Commission. We have Or Orso Farms located at um, uh, old Airline Highway and Airline Highway, 17602 Airline Highway, approximately 10 miles south of Hollister. Uh, two separate sites consisting of a total of 197.65 acres in the Agricultural Rangeland Zoning District, which received approval by the Agricultural Commissioner in 2022, just last year. And that is the update in regards to cannabis and uh, hemp. Are there any questions on this or any questions at all? Any but public comment? Is there any public comment in chambers? Will you please state your name for the record and you have three minutes. Good evening, my name is Maureen Nelson. Thank you, Abraham, for your presentation. I just have a few comments about the John Smith Road landfill. So the map for the John Smith Road landfill expansion does not show many developments such as Santana Ranch, which was approved in 2009. We're in 2023. Now, let's say in 2022, John Smith Road Landfill Waste Solutions Group presented the draft EIR. In 2022, Santana Ranch had already been on the books and developed and occupied since 2009. It's a misrepresentation when you're looking at where the landfill sits, where the expansion will be, and the integration with housing development in less than a one and a half mile space. 
I think that needs to be corrected and represented properly. Just a thought. When we talk about comments to the John Smith Road landfill, I personally put in, I don't know, 22 comments. Haven't gotten a reply yet. M. Wolf and Associates put in a 23-page comment. Haven't gotten a reply yet. It's a little interesting that it's advancing in the process of the governmental st structure of presentation, debate, consideration. Yet the public who has commented on the John Smith proposal hasn't gotten any reply as to your comments are bogus, your comments are valid, your comments have been taken into consideration, your comments have been included with others. We have presented this in others. You just didn't read it properly, Mrs. Nelson. That could be too. It is a lack of information. It is going under the covers and it's going to be approved without the consideration of the county residents. We don't want the landfill expansion. We don't need it. Thank you for your time, and Happy New Year. Thank you. You as well. Any other public comment in the chambers? Any on Zoom? There are no, pub no more public comments in chambers or via Zoom. Public comment is closed. Back to the commission. Any comments, questions, concerns? No. No? OK. Thank you. Item number four. Steve, you're up. Folks in back could please bring up a pr the presentation. Thank you. All right, good evening, Planning Commissioners and Mr. Chair. I'm Steve Blue, Public Works Administrator, and this presentation is um, for informational purposes um, regarding stormwater management, and it was requested uh, by this commission. So it'll just um, hit on the points that were uh, requested by these commissioners. So we're going to discuss three topics. One, um, just uh, what is our county code and policy regarding stormwater management on a proposed development? And then we'll discuss two specific developments and their kind of their status, uh, Santana Ranch and the Promontory Project, which is essentially an extension of the Ridgemark development. Um, and it's, it's also been known in the, as the bluffs in the past. So county codes and policies. Um, copied uh, section out of our code, but really the, the highlighted portion in yellow is the portion that I think is most pertinent to tonight's discussion. And so when a project is proposed, um, the engineers for the project are requested and required to calculate the flows that were running off of that area for a 10 year storm, which I'll mention in a minute prior to the development of that project. So a 10-year storm is simply um, a storm event that is, is expected to occur once every 10 years on average. And that's based on, depending on rain gauges and things, just historical data. So about every 10 years, you'll have this size storm event. And whatever size storm event that is, that calculation is made. And for the county requirements, the project is allowed to discharge, let's just say it can fill a, a six inch pipe full of water for that 10 year storm before the project is built. That's how much water is running off the site. Well, when this project is built, the project is required by the county to detain anything beyond that amount. And it's only allowed to release that same amount that's flowing through that six inch pipe. So um, we can talk a little bit more about that at the end, but that's really the requirement. So Santana Ranch, um, I copied out our, the whole development agreement on Santana Ranch and what's required and what's not, but the key is kind of in the middle that 
that project is required to detain the difference between the pre-development 10-year storm and the 100-year storm event that is after the project has been developed. A 100-year storm event hits the site, but the, still, they're only allowed to discharge that same 10-year flow, and that's all they're allowed to do. So I just wanted to real quickly kind of go over the, just the general drainage areas for maybe commissioners that aren't familiar with the, the project. So um, the bottom right corner of the project is uh, hat cross-hatched in red. That drainage area, which is also called a tributary area, it drains down towards the linear basin, which is adjacent to, um, to Fairview. The middle, uh, I'll say the left and middle section um, of the project, uh, which is kind of getting built out today, maybe two thirds of it, roughly the blue hatch, that drainage area goes down to basin B, which is at the bottom left portion, the very bottom left corner of the diagram. And the remainder, which is primarily, uh, well, it's just starting to get built out, is on the top and the, the upper left portion of the exhibit. That all drains to basin A. Um, a lot of that hasn't been built out yet but um, that will be kind of in the, in the future. And so those are kind of the three general areas, drainage areas, also called tributary areas. And I'll kind of go through the, where those areas discharge here in a minute. Oops. Um, okay. Funny. All right. So um, this is the tentative map that was approved, as was noted, probably 2009, 2010, um, per previous public comment. Um, and the tentative map is the blueprint for the project. Now, when the project's developed, the requirement is that the actual project has to be in substantial compliance with the tentative map. It doesn't have to be exactly like it's shown, but it has to be in substantial compliant, compliance. And so the first discharge point is that linear basin that's down by Fairview Road, and it's, um, it discharges actually from a linear basin the water starts to um, rise up into a riser pipe that has perforations, and that water flows into that pipe, and then eventually goes into, flows into the city storm drain system, and then down below us, which is technically west, but down into the, um, the existing Anders, older Anderson Homes development, and then into the city system. So that's the first discharge point. And that's that, um, that original blue area I'll go back to in a second. So that's the red area, excuse me, the red area. So the red area goes down in discharge point number one, and then we'll go to the basin B, which is just, well, actually, no. discharge point number two, yes, is basin B. And think of B as the bottom, kind of near Fairview Road. That's the way we remember it. So I'll go back to the blue area. The blue area discharges into this basin B, and that goes into a pipe, um, which is then goes into a ditch along Fairview Road, which, um, we, are, we have some plans to uh, improve and, and to install some pipes along the driveways along that road because in a larger storm event and some smaller storm events, that ditch doesn't really have the capacity that it should. And so we're working to improve that. But that's where discharge location two, which is basin B, discharges into. Three, um, and this is all per the approved tentative map, um, it actually goes into a basin of an area that's not fully developed yet with new homes and things, and it discharges technically northerly, which is to our left, onto um, kind of the area where it historically has discharged to. And um, I'll show you, I'll go back to that area in a second. So that's kind of just the black outline at the upper left corner of the exhibit. And so that's what was approved on the tentative map back in 2009, and those are the three basins that are essentially constructed today. Um, for a status of that, so uh, base, the linear basin is essentially signed off by the county and the water board, which has slightly different uh, requirements than the county does. Um, basins A and B are actually still being um, slightly modified per the water board's requirements. And um, it looks like they're getting close with to complying with the water board requirements as well. So 
promontory project adjacent to Ridgemark. Uh, I won't read it. It's basically just the same requirements. Um, and the difference between promontory and Santana Ranch is when the promontory um, project did their percolation tests, they actually found sand layers um, when they got to a certain level of their project, unlike Santana Ranch. Um, and so what the promontory project decided to do was actually they were gonna retain the water on their site. And so what that means is instead of allowing that six inch pipe or whatever the pipe was gonna be for their project to discharge, they said, we have really good percolation rates. We're actually gonna keep our stormwater on site. And so the lo two locations that they've done that, they have a really large basin, um, retention location number one, which is uh, essentially on the northern side of the project. And then they have a real small, well, not real small, a smaller retention basin down near the, what we call the south side connector. They have a new road that's gonna connect from that upper bluff roadway system. It's connecting down towards south side road and they have a smaller retention basin down there. And both of those basins, based on the percolation rates, will actually percolate and the, the requirement is within a period of 10 days, it has to percolate if you have you know, just one of those storm events. Now, if you have multiple storm events, complicates things a bit, but their percolation rates were pretty impressive when they hit that sand layer, and so they've decided to keep all their water on site. Now, if for some reason the, they have a real, real large storm, storm and it fills up the larger basin up above, it will overflow, spill into the streets, and spill into a drainage ditch that goes into the northwest corner of the project. Not the place where we had the landslide um, recently and even a few years back. Um, there's actually a, a, a ravine that kind of flows to the northwestern corner towards Ridgemark area and a, an adjacent property owner. And that's only if the basin doesn't have time to percolate, it'll flood the streets. Actually, all the pipes will fill, then the streets will fill, then it'll start flowing to that release point um, in a real, real large, I don't know if it's a 200 or 500 year storm event, but a real large storm event. It did not do that um, during the last storm events. There was some smaller um, discharge through that, that little spot, but that wasn't from the big basin. The big basin basically handled the, the last storm events. So that is promontory. So I'll pause there and ask for questions from the public or the commissioners. So thank you. We'll go to the public first. Is there any public comment in the chambers regarding this presentation? Any public comment via Zoom? There are no hands raised on Zoom. Public comment is closed. Back to the commission. Commissioners, do you have any comments, questions, or concerns? Commissioner I, Bianchi? I just, I just have a question. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. So these basins were built, and you said they're, they're not finalized yet by? So the, the, the two, two out of three basins at Santana Ranch, they met the county's codes, but they're still, the, the state water board came out and said, well, we looked at your basins, and we want you to expand them a little bit more is essentially what they said. So. Okay. So what are, what are they doing to get under the, the standards of California water? What are they doing? So th what they're doing, um, they are plugging up some of, so there's riser pipes also on those, those two basins, just like the linear basin. And so the water board said, we want you to essentially plug some of the lower um, perforations so that the water stays in the basin and has a chance to percolate and there's discussions about how well that will percolate, but that's the requirement of the state. And so um, Santana Ranch is complying with that requirement. So. And how come they're allowed to keep building while they're not complying with this water runoff? They are complete out of co compliance. They are not complying at all. And they continue to build. So two things, one, it's the water board request and requirement is, is somewhat of a newer requirement. And, they don't keep the county in the loop all the time. They meet with Santana directly, which is fine. That's what they do with all projects, not just Santana Ranch. And so they're having that coordination. Again, the upper, the North Basin A, 
uh, is essentially draining farmland and a few homes that have been built, but there's no new development. Basin B is built out. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. It's not built out. There have been homes built. They haven't built the commercial yet. They haven't built the retail yet, and they haven't built at least one of their phases yet. So um, they haven't had any recent new permits in that quadrant since the water board has been asking them to modify the basin. So. And on basin A in the back of that drains into Mansfield Road, there's nothing been built back there and it overflows already. So what are they gonna do to mitigate that? So the, there's still drainage that enters the basin and exits the basin when a rainfall event occurs, if, if that's a question. Yeah, but before they did all that land, uh, they did all their dividing up back there, making all their lots, that never drained out of like that, like it does on Mansfield Road. I know it doesn't and, until they moved all that dirt. And now those property owners have a mess. So what are they going to do to mitigate it? I, I'm not sure how to uh, answer a mess or historical comments. I'll, I, I'll, I'll just say no comment, I guess. So. Yeah. Okay. So Promontory did a, a good job of quickly correcting their issues. Uh, we'll have to have a meeting about the other project. Um, were there any other comments, questions? Not at nope. this time. Okay. Thank you, Steve. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. On to the public hearing. PLN 220029 Coke Farm Use Permit Amendment. Good evening, Michael Kelly, Senior Planner, and I will be presenting in a moment this project, and I'll just bring it up. Here we are. This project, Coke Farm Use Permit Amendment, at 1681 San, uh, San Justo Road. This um, is a uh, this is a vegetable or a, a produce packing facility located at 1681 San Justo Road. It is uh, here um, a mile north of the center of San Juan Batista, uh, two miles southeast of 101-129, where traffic to this facility would go out San Juan Highway to San Justo Road to this site right here. Here is um, an image of what is proposed. It is um, expanded, the proposal is expanded truck loading, three additional docks for um, truck loading in addition to the three docks that are there right now and also interior space um, associated with the three docks. That's um, in addition to the building which is for around 43,000 or so I don't remember offhand uh, square feet of existing building space on the main building here um, so here is that interior space here are the three docks adjacent to the three docks there and also uh, the ramp leading to the docks uh, 400 cubic yards would be excavated for a ramp leading down to the docks the uh, soil that it would be excavated from here would be used for expanding the detention pond so it would collect more uh, volume or be able to collect more volume of stormwater runoff. And um, the rest of the, uh, what the rest of what's going on with the facility is not proposed to change. It would be the existing use that was um, proposed and approved in 1990 under use permit 55990. Agricultural cooling, processing, shipping, um, no proposed change to the number of employees right now, and um, a customer pickup of wholesale produce, um, not proposed to change. Here is a view of the site and its surroundings along San Justo Road and the farmland. Looking closely, you see the um, property with um, its layout as viewed from above. Here is the driveway. The trucks would uh, come in and uh, reach this point and then back up into the dock, which is, well, existing dock is over here. The, uh, um, no, excuse me, it's over here. And uh, the new one would be built here. These buildings would be moved a little bit to accommodate room. And here that is in drawing form with the dock 
right here in the buildings that would be moved. Um, just another view of how the trucks would come in again, coming through the site and uh, to this end and backing up into the docks over here. And then when they leave, they will make a, a turn like this uh, and uh, return to San Justo Road. This is a view of the um, site of where the uh, new docks would be. Um, here is, the again, these buildings would be moved and um, the docks would be built here. Um, it's replacing a paved area with a building. So it's already a uh, established area, established as part of the use, um, already disturbed. Um, and uh, I'll get to some more details on that in a moment. Um, use permits, of course, we have to find that the uh, proposal is consistent with the general plan. And so we look at the general plan land use element. We see that this is the agriculture land use district. And um, the uh, purpose of that is to maintain agricultural land productivity and allow agricultural support uses, which pretty much describes this use. Uh, development sites are to uh, be uh, suitable, uh, lacking, generally lacking in natural hazards, and that describes this uh, site in large part uh, with the um, primary exception of the flood zone that is there. And um, that issue is governed by standards that we have in our local code and also in California Building Code. Uh, we have policies on agricultural, the agricultural economy and industry, um, diversification, integrity, flexibility, agricultural support. And this is uh, an agricultural support operation. And oh, one of these uh, calls for agricultural trucking and distribution, which of course this is. Uh, the economic development element has some similar policy in there too. Uh, jobs, housing balance, and uh, support for new and existing businesses. And this is investment in an existing business that uh, has potential for job creation. It's not proposing new jobs, but as investment, uh, and investment would typically be uh, promoting job creation. Circulation element, these policies uh, are on mitigating transportation impacts and dedicating right-of-way as development occurs. This project would uh, be uh, paying uh, impact fees toward transportation, <coughs> excuse me, T toward transportation and uh, would require dedication of right-of-way to contribute to San Justo Road right-of-way. Uh, and then the natural and cultu cultural resources element um, has a number of policies in uh, a, a couple in particular are related to water, groundwater, stormwater runoff. Uh, as I um, uh, pointed out, this is a paved area that would be replaced by a building, which means that um, replacing impermeable surface with uh, other impermeable surface, which means no net change more or less in the amount of stormwater runoff that would result from uh, this building um, and uh, no net uh, decrease in groundwater recharge potential. Although, um, as mentioned, the detention pond would be expanded anyway. The soil for excavation would go there and so that would be able to accept more volume of uh, stormwater runoff. And then the zoning district is agricultural productive. And um, that's intended uh, to do th these things, maintain productivity of agricultural land and um, provide areas for agricultural production and agricultural support. Uh, this, uh, this describes this project. Also, um, each of these projects, we have to see um, what environmental issues there are that need to be, oops, I jumped ahead. Um, what Environmental issues need to be studied, what might be uh, considered a significant impact. In this case, CEQA, uh, California Environmental Quality Act, offers an exemption that um, we can use to say that there is a certainty of no significant environmental effect. And the draft resolution goes into some detail about why we feel this is an appropriate 
um, uh, exemption to site, uh, uh, not requiring that this be um, subjected to detailed environmental review. And among the reasons are, like I said, we're using paved area. It's already a disturbed area uh, next to a much larger building, small addition, relatively uh, speaking to the lar uh, existing building. Um, this does not convert agricultural land. It's just disturbed land as it is. It's um, not establishing new impermeable surface. Uh, the floodplain hazard uh, uh, is governed by existing standards. Also, the use is um, complementary to existing agricultural land use and uh, the general plan land use district of agriculture. Uh, the um, agricultural uh, trans this is not introducing a new type of transportation to the area. It's already um, existing transportation, just uh, some uh, uh, more volume of it. Uh, and this is located along a corridor, uh, San Houston Road, that is established as a collector facility as uh, mapped in our general plan circulation element. And then we have conditions of approval um, that address uh, various topics that would be uh, uh, it categorized under um, environmental topics that would often be studied if this were to be studied and this these conditions in the draft resolution address those uh, topics. So um, with the draft resolution and these uh, findings and conditions in the resolution, uh, staff recommends that the commission review the staff report, hold a public hearing, hear any proponents and opponents of the proposed project, of which I only know of uh, as proponents, the uh, applicant and owner. I haven't heard of um, opponents quite yet. Um, and consider the resolution, the draft resolution, and adopt the resolution to approve the permit subject to the findings and conditions in the resolution. I'm available for any questions. Okay. Thank you. Are there any comments from the commission before we go to public comment? Commissioner Scaliotti. Some more of a question. How much more truck traffic are these three new bays going to put on San Houston Road? Because there's going to be more product being moved out of there. So apparently, there's. We're not going to be in, uh, increasing any of the product uh, or truck volume at this time. The, um, the purpose of the, the loading dock expansion is so that we can reduce the amount of overtime that we're currently occurring um, to load the trucks. So we're not going to be increasing any type of volume for the, for the indefinite future. For now. Any other comments? Okay, public comment. Is there any public comment in the chambers? Ms. Salinas. Thank you. Following up with Commissioner Scagliotti, the answer was for now no more no more traffic. So is can be part of the condition that the applicant come back when they decide that they're going to increase traffic so that we are aware of the volume of traffic? Thank you. Any other additional public comment in the chambers? Seeing none, public comment via Zoom. There are no hands raised on Zoom at this time. Okay, public comment is closed. Back to the commission. Are there any comments, questions, concerns? I know I had one about the deferment. We've talked about this before. We don't want any more deferred improvements because we have a list that's 20 or 30 items long that may never see the light of day, but that's another subject at a future meeting to discuss. Um, I don't want that item in there. I'd like to strike that if I can get consensus from the commission. But where I'll is second this? that. Item uh, page 135, condition 14C, 135 deferred 14 improvements. C. Doesn't ever work out very well. So that other, other than that, I don't have any conditions that I would like to uh, add or remove. Commissioner Scaliotti. I have a condition I would like added to that. If and when they do pick up more volume, which is going to happen automatically when you start putting more loading docks, that's a given. You're going to increase your production. So how can we word it that maybe consider 
do a traffic study for a turn lane on that well-used road out there if the if they do start to produce more volume and how we watch that i don't know but we got to keep an eye on that joel could you offer a suggestion i don't have a suggestion at this time okay the staff have a suggestion of how we could word that condition let me see if I understand that right. If there's um, uh, uh, have have a traffic study in uh, in the event of new truck volume uh, appearing on San Justo Road. Mm -hmm. um, three with three new loading docks, you're going to have eventually have. They're going to want to pay for them. They're going to. I would do it. I'd want more volume. Yeah, uh, it is more capacity, and that's why uh, it is coming as a use permit amendment, yeah. as opposed to somehow being found within the scope of the prior use permit. Okay, Commissioner Way. Yeah, it seems like we got a chicken and egg problem because wording it as half a traffic study if there's more traffic on San Jose Road, it's kind of like, well, how would you know that there was more traffic unless you had already done the traffic study? So I'm a little uncomfortable with the word, um, you know, but uh, I'd, I, I'm a little concerned about how we would actually put it into a condition. Commissioner Bianchi, any thoughts? Well, I mean, being from the trucking industry, I think, I think the, the, the problem that I think they're trying to solve is the hours of service um, that these trucks are able to, to operate. So they need to get them in and get them out. So if they're doing 12 trucks in a day, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, they're doing 12 trucks in a day, they need to get them out because these guys can only travel. And the problem is when they're sitting out on San Justo Road or 129, they're still technically on duty. So, I mean, it's more of a... Um, Okay. Okay. You know, I, I, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm all for the traffic deal, too, but I think, as the Commissioner said, I mean, I don't know that we can say that, hey, they had one more truck than they had yeah, the day before. That would be so. difficult. Okay. So you're good with okay. deleting that? Yeah, okay. I'm good. So is there a motion that contains removing condition 14C on the table? Or will... Uh, I, I'll move that we remove condition 14C. Okay. So we have a motion to adopt the rev resolution with the deletion of 14C regarding deferred improvements. Is there a second? A second. All those yeah. in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 4-0. Thank you. Public hearing is closed. Commissioner announcements. You have anything to announce? I do not. Commissioner Bianchi. No, too soon. Commissioner Scaliotti. No. Okay. I do have some future uh, agenda item requests. I would like to uh, discuss how we can plan for PG&E and their ability to provide power, in particular for commercial projects. Uh, they do need some time to get the uh, infrastructure in place. So I'd like to discuss getting that, our policies changed to uh, allow that. I would like to see a monthly application discussion regarding the new applications that you've received because oftentimes we won't hear about something for a year or two and uh, we kind of lose our ability to get ahead of certain problems. Uh, I'd also like to discuss reviewing our cell tower ordinances so that we can streamline that and make it uh, easier for somebody to put up a structure without having to go through the process of the Planning Commission. Uh, we already talked about it, but I'd like to have it on the agenda, is to do a general plan update. We haven't done one since 2015, and we're supposed to do them every five years, theoretically. And I think we've exceeded that by a couple of years, so I'd like to see that on the agenda. And uh, go over our deferred improvements list and see what progress we've made since the last time, which was I don't know how long ago, last year sometime. So those are the items that I'd like to see. Other than that, uh, my only announcement is welcome, Commissioner Bianchi. It's a pleasure to have you on. And I look forward to filling District 5's seat shortly. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? I motion to adjourn. 
Second. Second. Okay, Commissioner Banky seconds. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The meeting is adjourned at 7.56-ish. Thank you all. <laughs>